Have you looked at all 5,000 of these? And are you saying that all those differences that do change the meaning, that do change the theology, that do in some cases change the practice, that these are all in there in the one that's in heaven? Can you see what you're, what you're, what we're, this is the line that we know. That, listen, this doesn't make sense to us listening. And you might say, well, that's because we're ignorant. Okay, call us ignorant, call us idiots, like you'd love to do. You're going to call me an idiot for even asking this question. But see, we have to ask this question because we do live in the West. And because this is causing so much damage to your religion. And it's causing so much damage to your murtads that you got so upset with them for even asking the question. And you're saying, do not disagree with us. Well, that's the red line you're saying. Do not go beyond this red line. You're saying to all these other murtads, God bless them for asking the question. Because they need to know. Or let me ask you this right now. Do you still believe that not one word or one letter has been changed? As for the uh, Christian uh, missionaries who are out to convert to the Ummah, good luck with that. You've seen in the last, if you haven't learned anything, learn at least that missionary work has never been successful. Uh, and alhamdulillah, it never will be successful. I'm not trying to come off as dismissive, but they are not real academics. The reason why I don't listen to them is because they have nothing to offer uh, of my benefit. Now, I want to be clear here. I do listen to many non-Muslim academics. I am very engaged in academia. I listen to and I read books books written by Quran scholars that are not Muslims, they're in the academy. I Recently, I purchased a super expensive book by Brill. You have to do that. And I engage with actual academics. I want to be very clear here. But these missionaries in particular, they have nothing to do with the world of academia. They are untrained unqualified, ignorant, arrogant individuals who spout ridiculous claims that don't have a shred of credibility amongst actual academics. They don't even read Arabic. And they are literally like blind mice grabbing at whatever they can, trying to concoct a completely bizarre narrative and then preaching some garbled rubbish to their uh, to their choir who obviously have no clue you know, as to right and wrong about the religion of Islam. And because they have repetitively done this, I will have have to break my rule and just for once give these idiots the smackdown that they deserve to show them because they have no integrity to show them that they are utter fools who should not and cannot speak about the religion of Islam because they are a disgrace to the field of academia. They are untrained, ignorant people who don't have a clue about what it really is that they're talking about. Yesterday, for the first time in my life, I swear by the Creator who created me, Wallahi, wa billahi, wa tallahi. I looked at the series of, uh, of topics and I chose one at random, completely, as Allah is my witness. I swear by the one who created me. This is the first link that I clicked on and within five minutes of just uh, you know, scrolling through because I'm not going to listen to cover. I don't have time to listen cover to cover to something like this. And within five minutes of going through, this is what I found. Listen to this. And then he sent to every Muslim province one copy of this original. One to every province. Now let's see, what provinces is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the province here in Mecca, Medina, Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Alexandria, Cairo, Herat, and Nishapur. There's the word I was looking for, Nishapur. I knew it had a poor in it. Nishapur. There are the nine provinces. Now, let's put aside the fact that uh, the earliest references about the number of Uthmanic Mus'habs is four. You know, Basra, Kufa, Sham, and Medina. Some added Yemen. Very few sources added Bahrain. But four is the, 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 the correct number. Let's put that aside that, you know, because I'm not aware of any reference that says that Uthman radiallahu anh sent out nine copies. Let's, let's put that aside. He mentions nine cities. Now, realize this is not a slip of the tongue. This is not just, you know, he's sitting in front of an audience and he's speaking from his head because I understand. I have made such mistakes. You know, when you're sitting in front of an audience and you just say something, sometimes you say a word you shouldn't, you don't mean or intend. No, these are his prepared notes. This is a PowerPoint slide that he's prepared and he has material on his website that is exact same. He has, he is publishing material in this regard and he mentions that Uthman radiallahu anh sent Mus'hafs to nine cities, to 
nine places, right? And in that list, he mentions that Uthman radiallahu an sent a copy of the Mus'haf to Baghdad, the city that was founded by the Abbasids as their capital in the reign of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, a city that did not exist for at least 120 years after the death of Uthman radiallahu an. So allegedly Uthman is sending a copy of the Mus'haf to the city of Baghdad. And then here's the clincher. He also sends one allegedly to Cairo. I mean, guys, every high school student of Islam knows that Al-Qahira was named and called Al-Qahira by the Fatimids in 969 uh, CE 358 Hijra. Wallahi, when I saw this clip, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. I mean, my mind is blown by such utter ignorance only an untrained idiot i mean i'm sorry to be so brutally harsh here it's not my nature but if you're going to tell me that uthman radiallahu an sent a mushaf to qahira right you're going to tell me that cairo i mean you are not just a cretin of the highest magnitude you have publicly humiliated yourself and disqualified yourself from ever speaking about the basics of the religion of islam much less about some of the most advanced topics like the history of the Quranic compilations and the origins of the Qira'at. You don't even know Qahira and Baghdad were cities founded by the Abbasids and then the Fatimids. And you think that Uthman radiallahu anh, is sending a copy to cities that do not even exist. <laughs> oh dear, did he even realize that I'm using modern names? I always use modern names so people know what I'm talking about. Uh, of course I did use the word for Baghdad in the 7th century or by the time that Muhammad would have been living uh, it, uh, in the 7th century it was known as Stesiphon. No one would, I, if I were to say Stesiphon then of course none of you knew what I was talking about because you won't use that today. So I use Baghdad because that is the name that was introduced by the Abbasids in, in 749 or 750, the mid 8th century. That's true. Uh, remember, if you want to but then he went to really confront me on the word Cairo, that I shouldn't have used this because the name that was exists at that time was Cairo. Well, that's not true either. That is not the name that was used in the 7th century. And I'm a little surprised that he made this huge error. Cairo is actually the Arabic equivalent to what we would say Cairo today. But Cairo, uh, if you look at it, it was introduced in 968 by the Safinids, but what's fascinating that is the 10th century, and that is, and he did say the 10th century that Cairo was introduced. No, but then he said the word I should use is Cairo. No, Cairo is Cairo, it's the Arabic equivalent to Cairo. What would have been the name in the 7th century? Fustat. Fustat is the name that was used in that city. Uh, the, because remember, it used to be called Memphis, but Fustat is the garrison town outside of the city that the Muslims, or in this case, the uh, those who that took over and con conquered Egypt. That's the word that they would have used, the name. So he even got that completely wrong. Now, I'm not going to sit there and berate him for that, but I'm going to ask him to be careful when he's quoting me. Make sure he quotes me correct. At least we do that with him. Whenever we quote him, we actually film it and put it up there so you can see. And um, make sure that you understand that when I'm talking about an ancient city, I'm not going to use that name unless I'm... Specifically referring to the name of the ancient city, I use the modern name today, uh, and that's why it's important that he makes sure that he doesn't put up a. Uh, in this case, it was a straw man, and then he just tried to confront the straw man. He then went and he spent a bit of time on two other areas, and they had to do with this material. Actually, that with the, this book here, Daniel's book. And I, it's a video that I put together, I'm thinking it was in May of 2019, so over a year ago. And he made two major points on that and really confronted me. The first one is this idea of dumping the, the Huff's text, the Huff's text that was chosen by Muhammad ibn al husseini al-Haddad in 1924. And that I suggested that all the Qurans in the world were dumped in the Nile. So I'm looking through these lists here. I see another one, which is relatively recent compared to the other one. I said, okay, let me log on to this year. Here's what he has to say in this clip. 1936. Right. They, because they say it was such a success in the city of Cairo, King Farouk, who then came to power yes, in 1936, right. decided to put out a new edition for all of Egypt called the Farouk edition. Ah. The Farouk edition then took the Hafs text and made it Egypt-wide. 
1936. Right. That was so successful in Egypt. But before that, I forgot, I forgot one thing. When they did this in Cairo, when they, uh, Al-Haddad, Muhammad Al-Haddad did this in Cairo, they took all the other Qurans that were different yeah. than Hafs. They took it out into a boat and they sank them in the Nile. Oh. You so haven't heard we, this before we, either. No. no. We need to go down. We need so to do some They're dives. They're still there. We need to do some yeah, we dives. Need to do some dives. So <laughs> Don't waste your time. We have 10 of them oh, right yeah, here. <laughs> <laughs> We've like, already found so, 31 so of them. Like, now this one actually did get me laugh out loud. Literally, I LOL'd when I saw this. This is, this is comical. So apparently, uh, all of the Mus'hafs of Egypt uh, in the reign of King Farouk, which is barely a century ago, that were not Hafs, they were taken on a boat and they were dumped into the Nile and now we have to go scuba diving to go retrieve them. By the way, I'm a scuba diver. I'm an advanced rescue Nitrox uh, certified scuba diver, over 200 dives. So if you need a diver, believe me, I'm more than happy to go to go diving anywhere. Wallahi, where does one begin? I mean, you do realize, Mr. J, you do realize that, forget how ludicrous you sound, the, the sheer quantity of Qur'ans that would meet your criterion would not just sink a boat. They would block the entire Nile. I mean, I don't even understand. Do you, do, you, do you listen to yourself speaking? You think all the copies of the Qur'an that didn't conform to uh, the quote-unquote version, which again shows your, your ludicrousness, there is no version. It is a printing that is being printed for the first, one of the first times by a printing press. And so, yes, a committee is, is being uh, you know, uh, done together. By the way, where is the origin of the story? Again, half myths, blatant exaggerations, ludicrous claims. There is a German Orientalist, which is actually not verified, who claimed that when King Farouk printed... Uh, his copy of the Quran, there was an Indian uh, print uh, that had, according to the, 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 the committee, some technical errors, meaning the printing press of the Indian print was technical. And so according to this German uh, Orientalist, we don't, as of yet, we don't have ver verification elsewhere, that those copies were destroyed uh, respectfully, again, this is one of the key differences. When Muslims uh, want to, uh, you know, dispose of a mushaf, they will do so in a manner that is respectful. In the Christian tradition, it's disrespectful. In the Muslim tradition, you will burn it because you don't want to throw it into the trash, or you will throw it into the water. So, according to one German Orientalist, and it's, even if that happened, it's not a big deal. Maybe fifty or something copies of a, of a particular printing uh, were disposed of, but no one ever claimed that all the Qurans of Egypt that didn't conform to the King Faru were gathered in a boat, like, yeah, as if they would fit in a boat, and then dumped into the Nile. Utter ludicrous. I went back to look at the video, and I didn't see where I said that. I never said all the Qurans in the world were dumped. He didn't even understand. I guess maybe he just didn't watch the video very carefully, or, or may, I don't think he was intentionally trying to misquote me. Uh, I was actually, it was actually a joke. If you notice, I, we're laughing about it. Uh, we're saying, isn't it interesting that they took out, they took out the other 29, we're assuming that there were 30 official ones, Tufts had been chosen in 1929 to standardize the test for high school students. High school students were coming uh, and doing standardized tests, and they were coming up with all kinds of different references, Quranic references, that didn't agree. And this is the problem with the Qur'an. That's why they all are so different, and that's why they still are being printed today. So when you memorize it, you want to memorize it. In the, uh, with the script that you have grown up with, the script that you have memorized, you want to make sure that there's a public a printing of it. And so in order to standardize these tests in Cairo, in the city of Cairo, they had to throw in all the others and ask Muhammad ibn al husseini Hazrat to choose one, and he chose the Hafs. And then they took the other ones. What I'm saying, he took the other ones, uh, the, the other ones of the high school students there who, who had brought them to the schools. Those were taken out. And this is nothing more than a symbolism. It's symbolic throwing them into the Nile. Of course, no one would suggest, and I don't know where he got this idea that I was making uh, a suggestion that all the Qurans in the world at that time were thrown into the Nile. Anyways, nonetheless, he seemed to make a completely misconstrued. And then he went on and he talked about the Farouk, that this was actually, the story comes from the Farouk edition, which is in 1936, which is then chosen for all of Egypt, that, that book. And he suggested that that had to do with a German scholar. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing he thinks that that's where the story comes from. No, it doesn't. This story about the standardization, what Shadi, Dr. Shadi Nasser talks as the fifth canonization. Look at the book that's just come out two weeks ago. Dr. Shadi Nasser from Harvard University, who has taught uh, in Yale and is also taught now teaching at Cambridge University, one of the formal scholars in the world today. He is very clear that there are five different canons of the Quran. 
Uh, the first one would be, of course, that which every, all of us have been told about Uthman's canon of 652. Interesting, Dr. Shadi Nasser is not writing a book on that one. I think the reason possibly is because there is no, there's nothing there to look at from 652. The second would be uh, the Ibn Mujahid from 936, uh, where the seven readings were chosen. And the third one would be uh, the Astabi, Ashatabi, I guess is the best way to pronounce it, in 1194, the 12th century. The fourth one would be Al Jazidi, which he does refer to in this. He just kind of gives a reference to it in this video. And that would be 14, uh, fascinating, he never wants to put the date, 1429, that is the 15th century, that's 800 years after Muhammad. You have to put it on the timeline. And then, of course, the fifth canon would be this one in 1924. And he goes on and he says that this story probably is not, I'm, I, he thinks I'm making it up. He has a claim that is so preposterous. Wallahi, you wonder, is he even intelligent? Does he understand what he is saying? He says to his uh, his uh, his two uh, co-hosts or colleagues there, who are another story altogether, if you look at what they're saying, uh, that he says to them that, uh, you know, he talks about this King Fahd version of the Quran in 1985, meaning the uh, Madani, you know, Mus'haf printed by the King Fahd complex. And then he says, listen to this, that he's going to make a secret reveal on their show for the first time in history. He's going to come out and tell them uh, the truth about something that nobody's ever heard. Okay, Mr. J, what is this amazing truth you're going to tell us? Listen to this, guys. And I wonder truly, does he know he's lying or is he mentally insane? He says that they, some unscrupulous organization, they, who they are, the, the secret, uh, you know, Mukhabarat services of Saudi or some type of kamikaze or some ninja groups, they sent secret missions across museums all over the world to break in and to change the ancient manuscripts to conform with the King Fahad edition so that it looks like the King Fahad edition is in conformity with the most ancient manuscripts. And he claims that he has proof for this and that he has doctoral students that are going to be that are going to be exposing and talking about this. Now, the notion that, you know, and by the way, some of these manuscripts are in libraries in Paris, uh, in, in uh, the, the, the Museum of London. Uh, you have the Chester Beatty in, in Ireland. So according to Mr. J, simultaneously missions across the globe were sent in to break in to libraries, including the top copy, and to secretly change the, the manuscripts so that it matches up to the King Fahad printing of 1985. I mean, wallahi, Listening to people like like Jay makes me realize why there are still people who believe the earth is flat, you know? I, I don't know where he get that idea from because I do write in my notes. And he says he looked at my notes. I do write where the source is. And the source is Gabriel said Reynolds. In fact, I do mention that right around that video. I, I looked at the video quickly just now. And I do mention that this is Gabriel said Reynolds, the Quran in its historical context, written in 2008. And then I also go on to refer to the Quran in context, historian literary insights, uh, uh, investigations into the Quran's milieu by Angela Newworth and Nicholas Sinai in 2010. So this has been around for 10 and 12 years. Yes, Arkadi. Now, he may not like what I'm saying, but don't think that I'm making this up. I'm quoting these people. These are well-known scholars. Dr. Uh, said Reynolds is uh, Notre Dame University. He's one of the considered one of the premier scholars in the world today on the Quran. Uh, same with the New Earth and also Sinai. Argue with them if you don't like what we're saying, but we have to we have to go to where the scholars are saying. And remember, he is correct. I don't do this. I don't do this research, but I make sure that I quote what other scholars are doing. And almost everything I'm quoting on the Kirat now comes from Dr. Shadi Nasser, and I would love for him to have engaged at that point. He didn't. He didn't want to. And then he gets into this notion, and this was really curious. He says that, and, I, and uh, this is fascinating because in that show, I look at the camera and said, I'm making a statement right now that if King Fahd, the King Fahd edition, which was uh, canonized or which was chosen in 1985 for the whole world, and as the Hafsa is a standard text, if this was hap happened in 1985, and at that time it was 34 years ago, now it's 35 years ago, because this was over a year ago when I, I made this video, uh, then I would, then I said, then it looks like that somebody, that somebody, we, we, there was no standard to in order to make all these 4,000 changes that Dr. Brubaker has come across. Now, what's fascinating to me, I said that I looked at the camera, I'm making this, I'm making this claim here, 
that this all has had to happen since 1924. Now, since that time, and, and this is where, not, uh, and, and I thank, I, I thank Yasser Qadi. He was correct. I shouldn't have, uh, I shouldn't have made that claim a year and a half ago, and I don't make it anymore. I'm very careful not to, just because. Can you see how idiotic that is? And in fact, I have said it a number of times in my videos that you cannot make that claim anymore. I did it a year and a half ago, but I can't make it anymore because it, you, we, we, there was no way that anybody could change it. So it's obvious to me that these changes had to be made possibly during the Ottoman Empire, when the Ottoman controlled with many of these manuscripts. My assumption now is that these changes probably had to be made during the Ottoman Empire for two reasons. And I'm going, this is now November, uh, as I said, November the 26th. And I may have to change this. You're right. And yes, Akadi can slam me for it if he wants to. But this is where I'm asking for people to listen. I'm suggesting now that these changes have happened since the Ottomans came to power. So we're talking possibly uh, eight to eight hundred years in the last eight hundred years. But I'm saying that for two reasons. One is because we do know that the Ottomans did choose the Hafs as their Gidat. That's the Gidat they favored. And that's why Muhammad ibn al Husseini al Haddad chose the Hafs in 1924 because it was the choice of the Ottomans. So if that is the case, then, and they would have controlled almost all of these manuscripts. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17th century, up until the 18th century, up until the 19th century, when the Ottomans in 1924, no, I'm sorry, 20th century in 1924, when they lost uh, their empire. If this is the case, then I would suggest that that's probably when all these changes happen. So we're talking about hundreds of years, over a hundred years. But I, I'm doing that for a second piece, too. And I'm putting this out there. So don't get me and call me all calls and names, but uh, understand what I'm saying. In order to have, for the Ottomans to have done this, to have done these changes, there has to have been a standard. If the Hafs was their standard, then does that not stand to reason that this book Hafs is where all the other manuscripts are agreeing with this and not with these? They're not certainly not agreeing with this one here, the Warsh. They're certainly not agreeing with this one here. These are the two most popular today. The Warsh is, is the one that is memorized and used all over North Africa. This is the one that has not been standard for the whole world. There are 5,000 differences between these two. 5,000 differences. And when you look at all these razum, these consonantal changes that Dan Brubaker is coming up with, as much as Yasser Qadi does not like Dan Brubaker, listen, you can't just sit there and use vitriol against a guy who has a PhD in this area. This very area. This is his area. This is his PhD. You may not like him. And to say that he doesn't know Arabic, please... If you look at who they're quoting, you know, I looked at a, a, a number of, of their references. Generally speaking, a lot of their quotations, a lot of their material is coming from a particular person by the name of David Brubaker. And again, I don't have anything personal against uh, this individual. I've never uh, met him. Uh, I don't have anything personal against him. At the same time, uh, he's the only one that has a PhD in that uh, circle uh, in Islamic studies. At the same time, it is it is just astounding to me. Frankly, I don't understand how someone of this nature can be awarded a PhD. Uh, if it's any constellation, by the way, his PhD, even if it's from a good university, but the university is not known for Islamic studies. The university has no track record of producing Islamic studies scholars. It doesn't even have a reputable Arabic program. Uh, so he got a PhD from... A, a known university, but not one that is known for Islamic uh, studies. And by the way, he's not involved in academia. Um, he has no he has no position. Like you know, he's not he's not a player in the actual arena of academics. You know, there are some people. You know, they decide to do a PhD. Somehow they just get in. They and they move on with their lives. I think this is one of those types of individuals where he managed to eke out, just barely pass every exam and do it. Frankly, it is shocking that somebody of this nature uh, actually has a a, a PhD uh, because of the egregious errors that one finds on almost every page of anything he's ever written please i mean that's that's not only rude but that's not not very, that is not uh, uh, proprietous that's very improprietous to say that of another scholar but nonetheless saying that to say to suggest therefore that this was done since the 1924 i have pulled back on that in the last year and a half so just like god is correct and what I'm now asking is, did this all happen since the Ottomans were empire, uh, uh, had their empire? And then he made a huge error. Yasakadi made a huge error. He said that Dan claimed that he had looked at 10,000 manuscripts. 
Where in the world? He didn't say it once. He said it twice. You know, there's an account on Twitter uh, that's by some ungra- undergraduate somewhere in America that's a parody account of, of, uh, of uh, Brubaker. It's a parody account. And all that this person does, I, I don't know him personally, by the way, all that this person does is that he screenshots something from one of uh, Brubaker's publications and then puts it online. That's all that he does, just screenshots shots it. So I'm going to take from this parody account, right, uh, something that uh, David wrote that he said, he claimed, and he he, and he claims to this day that this writing of his, it is revolutionary and it is groundbreaking research that will allegedly cause the entire field of Quranic studies uh, to change. And by the way, he claims to have studied over 10,000 manuscripts of the Quran. And I honestly don't know what he means by study, because if you look at what I'm going to show you, wallahi, you don't even need to have any knowledge to see how ignorant this person is and again i have nothing against the person i'm just saying this but i mean how can you possibly make these egregious errors look at the first slide here now for somebody who claims to be a manuscript expert right he boasts as i said of having 10,000 manuscripts studied he literally has no clue that in early islamic manuscripts it's very common to write the number of the verse in the ancient abjad system in the ancient system not actual numbers but the abjad system where every single letter represents a number and so he takes the lam ha right you see you see that lam ha he takes the lam ha and he does not understand that it's 30 plus 5. Lam means 30, ha means 5. And so lam ha means verse number 35. And he feels that it is an added word, lahu. And notice the idiot actually says that there is a lam ha at, look at it, 1635. And he says, I don't know what it's doing there. I've made this really cool discovery. Doesn't really make sense over here to have a lahu. It must be a post-production alteration, uh, alteration, but clearly there's some message being sent here, some major shifting message. But I don't know what it is this is how jahil this david is that he doesn't even know that lam ha is the number 35 it's there and the idiot literally says 1635 lahu i don't know what it is my god and i have to respond to people that are taking from him do you understand my exasperation and frustration i mean can you cut me some slack when i'm being so harsh here that i have to actually waste five hours and another hour doing this video to to clear myself of ever being associated with a bunch of imbeciles like these these ten thousand manuscripts where in the world did he get this ten thousand manuscripts from Daniel has never made that claim. We have never made that claim. Uh, I know of 10 manuscripts that he looked at, and there's more than that, but the 10 are the ones that, that he was doing for his doctoral thesis where he found 800 differences, 800 completely differences uh, with the Constantinople text. And this has nothing to do with Kerat. This has nothing to do with Araf. This has nothing to do with the five uh, dots uh, or uh, critical marks or the three vowels, okay? This is the Razum. This is the Constantinople. This is the skeletal text. That's why it's so damaging. And I went doing his doctorate for Rice University. Now, good old Yasser has no, he does not like Rice University, and he doesn't like Yale, that's for certain. He even says later on uh, that that's where people get corrupted at Yale, as he got corrupted, though he got his PhD from there. I would, but uh, that, that's, hold on to that. 10,000 manuscripts, I, Yasser, I don't know where you got that from. Uh, I would suggest that you be careful how you quote Dan. He's never said 10,000 manuscripts. And he says, therefore, all of us, David, myself, and Daniel, we are ultra crepidarians. You know, actually, there, there is a word that comes to mind. I mean, it's still in my head from my GR, GRE days, almost uh, 20 years ago, I took the GRE. And um, there's, a, there's a word there. What is it? Uh, ultra crepidarian. Ultra crepidarian. That's the word. Look it up. Ultra crepidarian. Ultra crepidarian is a person who not only speaks outside of his area of expertise, he speaks way out of his league, but he also feels the need to announce to the world that he is an utter idiot. This is the word that comes to mind when I'm dealing with these people. Ultra crepidarian. Memorize it, and I hope that inshallah ta'ala, if one thing comes out of this lecture, please, oh Muslims, you know, that are involved with this, start using this word and popularize it again, because that is exactly what these preachers are. Ultra crepidarians. I would suggest much of what you have shown from this video that you would also be part of the list. Uh, come and join us. Yes, it looks like we're all ultra crepidarian. So I'm probably going to title this an ultra crepidarian response to Yasser Qadi. Finally, he gets to the holes in the narrative. To be fair, I did use language that I regret. 
And the claim that there are holes in the narrative is employing language that did create confusion. And I apologize, I ask Allah's forgiveness for that. There's simply uh, no excuse and I learned from my uh, mistakes. And my senior ulama that I look up to asked me to get rid of the interview because it's going to cause more confusion. There was no covering up. I just don't want to cause more confusion. But when these missionaries are persisting to take that clip and then pretend that my topic is somehow related to their Incompetency. I have no, uh, you know, recourse except to go public and show people that I have nothing to do with uh, these Cretans whatsoever. And I had to waste a few hours just to quickly show you their level of incompetence. And as I said, I swear to you, I have not spent more than five hours. And even that, I regret that I had to even spend five hours. Can you imagine if somebody actually, you know, dedicated you know, more time to go over their mistakes and show how utterly juhal these people? Uh, you know, not they're not even worthy to preach a basic course of Islam at the middle school level, much less speak about some of the most advanced issues of Ahruf and Qiraat and preservation of the Quran. Nonetheless, they're using my clip of the holes in the, in, the, in the standard narrative. And yes, I did claim this. And I need to own up to my words or retract uh, or uh, you know somehow clarify. And I have no problems discussing with anybody who is interested and, and willing to learn. I do believe that a mainstream opinion, because here's the point, there are multiple you know uh, interpretations of the Ahruf and Qiraat. And everybody knows that uh, there's over 40, by now, everybody knows there's over 40 opinions about the Ahruf as, as, as Suyut and others mentioned. And I follow another one of them the one that has become dominant the one that is now you know mainstream this is what i called the standard narrative but in reality there are many standard narratives even what i'm holding is a standard narrative it's just not the one that is most common in our times and so I am, again, what I don't want to go, there's no need to go into details in the video, and I'm more than happy to discuss with anybody, but I don't mind giving you some examples so that you understand that when I said there are holes in the narrative, I regret the wording. But what I'm trying to say is that there are questions that there's a majority opinion, and then there are minority opinions. For example, one of the issues that is the issue of the tawatir of the qira'at. I mean, uh, I believe that the qira'at are mutawatira in their essence and syntax, but not necessarily in their you know specific choices of each and every rawi, of each and every tariq. And by the way, this was the position, the later position of the giant Ibn al-Jazari. Initially, Ibn al-Jazari said that everything is mutawatir. And then towards the end of his life, he also came to this position, which is basically one of my uh, disagreements with now what is the, the mainstream. Uh, also, uh, another uh, thing that I disagree with as well is the origins of the differences of each and every tajweed rule, each and every uh, pronunciation of the vowels, right? You know, as maybe anybody who, uh, who studies the Qiraat is aware, there are so many tajweed rules, there are so many ways to pronounce things. Things. So, for example, you know, wadduha, or you can do imara sughra, wadduha, or you can do imara kubra, wadduha. You can do it all of these three types, right? Now, did the Prophet himself uh, recite it in these three ways, which is what mainstream says? Or did he allow some of the Sahaba uh, to recite in their dialects? And that became accepted. And that is accepted as a part of the Quran as well. I mean, my position is, is uh, uh, the latter, not the former. And by the way, even Ibn Taymiyyah, again, Ibn Taymiyyah clearly says that, you know, many of these differences, the pronunciation differences, they go back to the Sahaba and to the dialects of the Arabs, okay? So this is another thing that I might disagree with, you know, the majority opinion. I mean, also the development of the orthography of the Mus'haf, again, if you study the evolution of the ancient Arabic script that was first written down in what is called Ma'il and then Hijazi and then Old Kufic and then Modern Kufic and then Nasta'liq and then along the way you have orthographic changes coming. For example, uh, the word Qala uh, was typically written in back in the day with Qaf Lam and later on it started being written by Qaf Alif Lam, right? So again, this is uh, something that I'm advocating and many scholars of uh, of the manuscripts advocate this as well that there was some you know spelling changes. I mean, what's the big deal if instead of spelling color like like the British spell it, you spell it like the American spell it. It's the same word, right? So these are some of the things when I said holes in the narrative, which definitely, you know, I regret it shouldn't have, you know, made it such a big deal. But yes, there are opinions that I hold that are not the dominant opinion. And every single one of these opinions deals with some minutia, some abstract issue that I respectfully have a position that Alhamdulillah has precedence. It has scholarly backing. I am not the first and I'm not the only and I'm not going to be the last. The problem that happened 
is that this group of critics, right, these Orientalists and whatnot, they had no clue what I'm talking about. And they took my clip and they exaggerated it as if I am in any way, fashion or form linked with these idiots and ignoramuses. And that is why I have to make this uh, video. The problem with these critics is that they think they have unearthed something absolutely absolutely new that no one before them has ever understood they exaggerate the notion of of, of qiraat to make them different versions of the quran they exaggerate the the printings king farooq printing and king fahad printing and they think these are different versions of the quran and you know here's a point to to the muslim audience okay and even if you're not muslim but you're listening for information about this group of people i want you to know one simple fact each and every bit of information that this group picks that is authentic, that is true, because a lot of it is just mythology or, fa or, or fake. Each and every bit of it that is true, they're finding from within our sources and references and our ulama, not only were they well aware of these differences, but no one in human history ever considered anything of this to be different versions of the Qur'an or different competing texts of the Qur'an. This is sheer lunacy. This is stupidity. There's the, the vast majority of these differences are pronunciation. The qira'at themselves, the bulk of the differences are tajweed and pronunciation related. I mean, for example, if I mean, let me just think of an example. Uh, I mean, <laughs> American and British English, right? Uh, uh, what's a, what's a few words that the Americans and the Brits uh, pronounce differently? I mean, what if an American says, "Can you bring me a, a, a glass? Can you bring uh, me a glass of water? Can you bring a uh, okay? Let me put in garage because that's definitely always an important. Uh, can you bring a glass of water to the garage? Okay, if an American says that, a Brit says it. How's he gonna say it, right? Uh, I'm gonna try my fake British accent here. Can you bring a glass of water to the garage, right? They speak in a higher pitched voice, right? Glass of water in a into the garage. You know, there's differences, right? Glass of water to the garage, right? There's a difference there. Is anybody going to say that these are two different versions? I mean, how foolish is this? But this is what the equivalent of what they're doing. Now, again, to be fair, obviously there are more differences uh, than pronunciation and there's sometimes Arab differences and whatnot. But again, these are all differences that are well known, well accommodated. They, Whichever understanding of the Ahruf and Qiraat you follow, and there's over 40, whichever one you follow, all of these differences are explained in a very very rational manner that fits in with everything else what these people do it's literally as if they cut off 80 90 percent you know of the evidence that they have they take the little bit that they have they add their own imagination and they construct an alternative universe that has nothing to do with the reality and that's why i needed to make this video to distance myself from uh this uh this intellectually bankrupt lot and the only thing he's asking he's really talking about is the word holes in the narrative. That's all he wants to talk about. Because then he goes on and says that the Tajweed new rules, these are the vowel, these are nothing more than vowel pronunciations. And today that's true. They are vowel pronunciation, but they're in a written text. The five dots and the three vowels are to give you the delineation of which are the different ways to pronounce it. And see what he's not thinking through, and this is what an awful lot of Muslims have not yet come back to us on. When Al-Buhari, look at Al-Buhari, volume six, Book 61, Hadith number 510, when it says there that these, these um, uh, Medinans who had gone up to the battle there in Azerbaijan, and when they were lit, uh, gone to the mosque and they were fighting alongside Muslims, who other Muslims who had come from uh, places in Iraq, Basra, and Kufa, and also Syria, Damascus, they were all fighting together and they would go to the mosque and, and they would then recite the Quran. And as they, these uh these from, uh, Hijazis, uh, from the Hijaz, that's the central part of, of Arabia, where Mecca and Medina are located, when they heard the Quran being recited by these others, they heard different pronunciations, and they went to blows. They started fighting them. And so Hudayfa has to come back. He runs back down to Medina, and he insists that Uthman standardize the text so they don't have many different Qurans, like the, supposedly the Christians and Jews have many different Bibles, is what they're saying there. Now, what's fascinating, what does Uthman do? He, he acknowledges it. He gets Zaidi Min Thabi to then rewrite the Quran in the Qurayshi dialect. This is the dialect that they claim. And this is, a, I mean, this is the, we're, we're coming out with lots of ideas about what this Qurayshi dialect is. Nonetheless, they're claiming uh, that this did. He then wrote it in the Qurayshi dialect, handed it to Uthman. And then Uthman sent it to five cities, uh, Basra, Baghdad, Dem I mean, sorry, not Baghdad, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus in the north, and Mecca and Medina there in the south, in the Hijaz. And then he took all the other manuscripts. Are you listening to this, Yasser? 
Dr. Cardi, are you listening now? He took all the other manuscripts and burned them. So now stop and think. How can you burn pronunciation? Unless, of course, you have the dots and the vowels. You have to have the dots and vowels to be able to see a difference in pronunciation. If you're burning manuscript, you're burning paper. You're burning books. Help me here. Come back with me here. I've not seen any Muslims really respond to this. And this is something that Yasser Khan just said it really flippantly right off the top. This is nothing more than vowel pronunciation. This is nothing more than dialects. Okay, so they're dialects, but they have to be written on a paper. They have to be written in a dialectical form. And these dialectical forms have to have five dots and three vowels to understand the different dialect in a written text. That is what this is. And the first one is this guy right here, Ibn Amir. This is the first of those to be written in a dialectical form that is different. And he is from Damascus. And his date is 736. This is the next century. This is right well into the next century. And all these other ones... The 30 that we that are made official, they go all the way up until 912, the 10th century. So from the 8th century up until the 10th century, you have all these different dialectical forms that are written using the five dots and the three vowels. Yasuf Khadi, this could not have been a prop. This could not have been a. This could not have been just dialectical differences in the 7th century because there were no dots and vowels to make it uh, understandable in a written text. Okay, are you helping? Help me, help me out with this because I, this is something I've yet to see Muslims really respond to. How do you burn, therefore, pronunciation if it's just oral? Obviously, this is not oral. These are written. You burn books. You burn paper. That means it had to be written differently. And we know that these different writings do not even appear for another century. Well, eighty years. Okay. <sighs> And then he says this is nothing more than different ways of saying wa or water. Wa. Uh, well, okay, if that is so, you can pronounce it differently. But how do you write that in a Quranic text? How do you write it in the Arabic script? Wa versus water. How do you do that in the 7th century when there's no dots and no vowels? Bingo. I think that that's what I'm asking you. As for my uh, Muslim critics, you know, for those that have never studied, I'm speaking now to those that have never formally studied Islam. Those that are really not qualified to take on uh, debates within you know, scholarly circles within Islam. I'm trying to be gentle. Please, my dear brothers in Islam, you are not giving da'wah when your main focus is to refute other du'at. You need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just sit down and be quiet. You have done enough damage in your overzealousness to declare other Muslims and other people of knowledge and other students of knowledge and maybe even other scholars to be deviant. This is no longer about me and you anymore. This is about the whole drama that has been created, the scandal that has harmed the religion of Islam, the ammunition that you have given to Islamophobes and missionaries. So please, for the sake of Allah, learn from your previous mistakes and don't repeat them. Leave refutations to those who are qualified and concentrate on teaching the people that which will benefit them. If you really feel a certain individual has gone astray, go to those who are more senior to him and you. Go to those who are the seniors in their age and their knowledge. And there are people I look up to. Wallahi, one sheikh said to me, take the video down. Hundreds of people uh, that are Twitter, whatnot, they were saying, I, I didn't, they're not people that I'm looking to, to for knowledge. One sheikh said to me, take the, the video down. And khalas, samirna because I respect that particular person as somebody who is senior to me in age and knowledge. I listen to my elders, inshallah ta'ala. This video is not meant for them. It's really meant for the people that we should all understand are wanting to harm this religion. It's meant for those missionaries, unscrupulous ones, and those murtads that have taken these words and, then used, and misused and abused my name. And I wanted to say to them, enough is enough. And I'm not going to engage anymore with that crowd because really they have proven themselves to be arrogant jahils who are simply below my level of academic research. And they're also, some of them, not everyone, but especially one in particular, is a vulgar, obscene, evil jerk. I mean, honestly, there's nothing else to be said. So I have no reason to engage with somebody of this nature. And now I fully understand that this video, because I mentioned them by name, it's going to be followed by hundreds of refutations. So be it. I mean, there, I have one life to live. If they choose to waste it, 
you know, barking after every single issue that they want. That's their business. As for me, I want to leave a productive legacy when I'm gone. And I want to do that which is going to be beneficial for myself and my Lord and my Creator. And I tell these Christian missionaries and these murtads, you do as you please. I am doing as I please. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the ultimate judge. And Allah will show who is the real one, who is sincere, and who is the one who is worshipping Him. And with this, I conclude this video. And inshallah, until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Oh, let, me, let, me, let me start with this question first. Here's the first question. These many kira'ats, which one of these is the one that's in heaven? Which one of these is the one that was revealed to Muhammad between 620 to, 610 and 620, uh, 610 and 632, that 22-year period? Which one of these, and I just have eight here. There's, there's 30 of them. Actually, I have nine with this one here. Which one of these is the one that Uthman commissioned Zaidim Tabi to write in 652. And that's what Muhammad Hijab was asking you. When he put his hand out there and he said, I'm giving you a blank sheet of paper, a blank mushaf. What Quran, which Qurat, which Aruf are you going to put there? He wasn't talking about pronunciation orally. He didn't want you to tell you what an oral pronunciation. He wanted to know what you were going to write there. Is it going to be the Hafs? Is it going to be the wash? Listen, it's just between these two right here. There are 5,000 differences. So which one of these? Is it the Hafs? Is it the wash? Is it Ibn Amir? Is it the Kaloon? Ibn Kathir? al Qusay, Khalaf? Shoba? al Duri? Those are the ones I have here. Which one of those was actually comes from heaven? Which one of those actually was the one revealed to Muhammad? That's the first question. Please answer that question. Okay, stop calling us names and all kinds of vitriol. That's not going to help. It doesn't help you academically. It doesn't help your authority before the world. And listen, most people see that when you go to vitriol, when you start using ad hominem, it usually means that you've lost the debate. And ironically, you really didn't talk about this. You didn't look at my videos on this. You didn't ask uh, and even ascertain what I'm saying about the get up. You never looked at one of those talks that I've done on it. And I've done 10, 20 of them already. Well, actually, since June 8th, probably only about 10 of them since June 8th. Number two, what is it that happened to you at Yale University? Exactly what crisis did you go through? And why is it this idea that you have that if you go to Yale or Rice University, that these are not legitimate places? You got your doctorate there. So are you saying your doctorate's not legitimate? If you say that you got corrupted by Yale? Please un help us understand that. You talk about, and I remember in the video you said that there was, uh, that th there are certain, you have a respect for the Quran. The Muslims have a respect for the Quran. And there are certain, there's a line beyond which you don't go. A red line you, you refer to. We don't go beyond this red line. Well, we don't have red lines here in America, and you should know that. You live in Houston, you should know. You were at Yale, there is no red line at Yale. You can ask any question you want, because that's what has been asked of our Bible. So I'm asking you these questions. Where, what red line is it you can't go beyond, and why is it you, aren't, you weren't able to answer Muhammad Hijab in 25 minutes? He had to ask you twice, what are you going to write? Which one of these kiddots is the one in heaven, the eternal one? Well, the obvious answer is, None of them are, because none of them, there is no dire critical mark. There was no vowelization uh, for the one that's in the, preserved in heaven. That was written, that was created by man. That was created by men after the 7th century. Bingo. Put that under your hat and see how you're going to run with it. Then thirdly, what are the holes you were referring to? If you said that I shouldn't have used that word, what holes exactly were you referring to? Because you actually were meaning something, and I would suggest those holes are the fact that for a thousand years now, you Muslims have known about this. Listen, 736, 738, 770, all the way up to 812, all the way up to Ibn Mujahid, 936. Oh, don't stop there. Can you see? We're talking about over a thousand years now you've had this material, and you did mention that, that for a thousand years, you can, this has been the, the most difficult question to answer. If it's the most difficult question to answer, then why all this vitriol against us when we ask the question? All we're doing is asking the question that should have been answered a thousand years ago and should have been answered by you while you were at Yale. You've had 25 years to come up with a better answer than all of the Qurans are 
All the, sorry, all the kirats are the Quran. That was your final answer after 20 minutes by Muhammad and Job finally assisting. All 30 of them? Do you realize the team in London has already found 93,000 differences? Have you looked at all of those 93,000 differences? And that's just looking at 23 of the 30. They've already come up with 93,000 differences. The team in Australia has already found 5,000 differences between these two. Have you looked at all 5,000 of these? And are you saying that all those differences that do change the meaning, that do change the theology, that do in some cases change the practice, that these are all in there in the one that's in heaven? Can you see what you're, what you're, what we're, this is the line that we know, that listen, this doesn't make sense to us listening. And you might say, well, that's because we're ignorant. Okay, call us ignorant, call us idiots, like you'd love to do. You're going to call me an idiot for even asking this question. But see, we have to ask this question because we do live in the West and because this is causing so much damage to your religion and it's causing so much damage to your murtads that you got so upset with them for even asking the question. And you're saying, do not disagree with us. Well, that's the red line you're saying. Do not go beyond this red line. You're saying to all these other murtads, for God bless them for asking the question because they need to know. They need to know why is it that you have been saying for years and years and years and years, and you have said this for years, that there is not one word, there is not one letter that is different. You're the one that said that, Yasser Qadi. You continue to say it. Or let me ask you this right now. Do you still believe that not one word or one letter has been changed? See, that's a red line that now has stopped you. That's a red line that you are not stopped. And remember what you did say in that, in that interview on June 8th. The rest of the world has come leaps and bounds in the last hundred years. And they're looking at us like an emperor with no clothes. Until you answer these questions, you do, to us, look like an emperor with no clothes. Your own words, back at you. Please, get some clothes on. Start asking, the, answer these questions. Stop talking about this red line, which you can't go beyond. And stop saying that you have to take my class, but then we'll do a deep dive. But you couldn't even answer Muhammad Hijab there in 25 minutes. And then I'm going to end with this. I want to know from you, Yasser Qadi, when is the first complete Quran that's just like this one here, not the English translation, I'm talking about the Arabic, the first complete Arabic Quran all 114 surahs, when is the earliest that you can find? Give me a date. Tell me where is that ubiquitous quan that you're always talking about? Where is this Uthmanic tra uh, manuscript that you're always referring to? Where is this manuscript that's 114 surahs and that every word in every letter is exactly like the one I have here? And I'm not talking about the Kirats. I'm not talking about the Ahruf now. I'm talking about the Razum, the skeletal text, the consonantal text, what Dan Brubaker is coming up with. And he is the first to publish this. So don't sit there and wipe him across the table and say that this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This is the first man that's had the courage to write and publish. And that's why you are only have vitriol to throw at him. When you throw vitriol and ad hominem and the kind of words you use against Dan, against me, and against David, I can pretty well see that you really don't have answers to these questions. You really don't have answers. And because they have repetitively done this, I will have to break my rule and just for once give these idiots the smackdown that they deserve. I, I was fascinated because I was waiting for the smackdown to happen. I didn't really see it happen. I really didn't understand what his problem was because he did actually go to our material on him.